Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, which today is all about casting. Yes, it was a huge week for casting, where interestingly though, nothing was officially confirmed. Still, some actors uh, began talks for some very big roles, which is why they're getting headlines uh, about it, but also a uh, rumor broke about Star Wars, about the casting for the lead of Star Wars from Variety. And it's such a big story with such potentially uh, huge implications for Hollywood in general that that's the first story we're going to talk about today. So what Variety broke was the shortlist of, for who J.J. Abrams wants to play the Jedi Apprentice who will go up against Adam Driver's villain in Episode 7. So I guess that's set by the way. I think there was some, you know, there's never officially announced that Adam Driver would be the villain in Star Wars, but that seems to be the case. We're hearing it enough from, from you know, really trusted sources that Adam Driver is the big bad. So that's set. So the question is who will be going opposite him. So uh, Jesse Plemons is still on the list. We've discussed that here before from Breaking Bad. Uh, Todd, I think he's a very good choice. Also, interestingly, Ed Spielers, who's Jimmy from Downton Abbey. Uh, I think that is a really out of left field choice. Uh, I guess maybe he's a little Mark Hamill-y, you know, for the, you know, in the first film, uh, New Hope. I can see maybe that kind of correlation. Same with uh, a theater actor, Matthew James Thomas. These guys uh, don't really quite seem like your typical hero, but as I said, they have that Luke Skywalker-y kind of look. Uh, however, this character, that's another rumor that came out, this Jedi Apprentice isn't going to be related to any of the main characters from the original trilogy, uh, the Skywalkers or Han Solo, for, for instance. Uh, and that is another rumor as to why uh, it's, they've taken so long, why they had to do rewrites, why the script was taken away from Michael Arndt and Lawrence Kasdan and J.J. Abrams took over, because uh, Michael Arndt was writing a story that was kind of the continuation of those family lines. You know, the prequel is all about Anakin Skywalker, so then the, these new sequels were going to be about uh, that family line continuing. But it looks like J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan have decided to focus on fully new characters and move those, you know, descendants to the background, which I actually think is, you know, a better idea. I think considering how the prequels really weighed down by, you know, comparisons and having to tie into the original trilogy, I think freeing themselves up a little bit to be a little fresher is a smarter choice. So I'm actually for this. But there's another reason that there's been a delay, and that is because J.J. Abrams is trying to bring some diversity to the Star Wars franchise by casting a black actor in this lead role. So let me finish the list uh, of who's on here for this short list of who plays, who's going to play this Jedi, which is why this made such so many headlines this week. One is Ray Fisher, another theater actor who happens to be uh, African American, but also John Boyega. Now this is fascinating. John Boyega is actually from the UK. He was in Attack the Block, very good, to the point where actually when I was reviewing that film, uh, I felt that he'd make a great uh, Black Panther potentially. I think he's a very good actor, but he also has um, kind of an anger to him, which I think uh, was very palatable. He did a very good job playing like this gang member in the UK versus these aliens uh, in Attack the Block. I think he's a really good actor, but he never actually really got anything off of Attack the Block, and he just kind of faded into the background. But J.J. Abrams remembered him, or perhaps J.J. Abrams' casting director uh, remembered him. But apparently he's done quite a good job in the reads he's done so far, and he's on this final list of five to play the role. Now, you might be thinking, well, why is there a list of, you know, black actors and white actors? Is J.J. Abrams going for diversity or not? But I think that the reason maybe potentially we haven't heard any, you know, confirmed casting about this role and why it's taken so long, even though they're supposed to start shooting any day now for a 2015 release, is because Disney might still be dragging its feet as if this is a move they want to make. Do they want to cast, have a black lead in their Star Wars franchise? It's a big decision, and I can bet you that Marvel and DC will be watching the success of such a film very closely to see if they should do a Black Panther movie or a Jon Stewart Green Lantern film. And I hope J.J. Abrams does this. I think it's time. I think it's. Uh, I think he has Adam Driver in the villain role. Uh, and I think John Boyega is just a great actor. I'm not familiar with Ray Fisher's work. Uh, Chiwetel Ejiofer has apparently also been reading. Maybe he'll be in another role. But I, you know, Samuel L. Jackson was in the, you know, in the prequels, but kind of, you know, that was more stunt casting. I don't really think that even, I don't think you would put that even under the category of diversity because, you know, you just would look at it and be like, hey, Samuel L. Jackson is on the Jedi Council awesome. You know, he wasn't re like a fully realized character, even though I think outside of the movies, they've tried to build up his character a little bit. But I think to your mainstream movie going audience, he just was always Samuel L. Jackson with a lightsaber. So I think this is a really exciting choice. I think it would show a lot of faith in, you know, the uh, the, de the black demographic and the Latino demographic, those moviegoers. Uh, and, it, and, you know, you're not, you're creating a film that's diverse. As I said, you still have Adam Driver, you're going to have the descendants of 
Uh, and maybe John Boyega will be a descendant of, you know, the, the Skywalkers or Han, uh, you know, Han Solo and, and Princess Leia. I don't know how that will work. We've been having that discussion a lot with Michael B. Jordan and Fantastic Four. Uh, but still, I think that this, to play this diversity card is exciting. But it is risky. I, I, I don't think it's risky personally. But I can see where Disney's coming from. Uh, and I guess they're really trying to, you know, see if this is a choice they want to make. So I'm curious how you guys feel about it. Do you think this is exciting? Do you care? Would it hurt the movie in your eyes? Would it be just stunt casting? Uh, and do you like their choices for who they have? Do you like jo uh, John Boyega? Are any of you familiar with the work of Ray Fisher? Or do you think they should go with Jesse Plemons or Ed Spielers? You know, do you think do you think this is just not the right time or the right franchise? What do you think uh, of a potential Star Wars with a, a, a the white villain Adam Driver and a black hero, a Jedi a, apprentice played by a, a black actor? I'm curious to how you guys feel about it. So we'll see. So we'll see what we'll see if Disney has the guts to make this choice. Because it's Star Wars. If any series can really, you know, lead the charge and, and, and have give people have a you know a leap of faith who maybe wouldn't see a film with a black lead, I don't know who that is really is any of these series, but I mean I'm sure obviously they must exist. Um, I think Star Wars could get them to, to go. And so I think it's very exciting. Alright, so that's the first story of the day. The second story is kind of, you know, there is a step forward, here is a step back. Uh, it was announced that Rooney Mara was in final talks to play Tiger Lily in Warner Brothers' Peter Pan. And uh, a comment that I read online that I thought was really great. Uh, someone said, wow, way to go, Warner Brothers. You've cast the whitest, richest woman in the world to play a Native American. And that's true. As, I, as I've mentioned here before, I think with Kate Mara, when I, I was talking about the fantastic forecasting, Rooney Mara comes from an incredibly wealthy family. Uh, the Maras, who own the New York Giants, and the Rooneys, that's why her name is Rooney Mara, the Rooneys who own the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. They are incredibly wealthy, uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, she, I have to say, she seems pretty white. So the fact that they would cast such an actress to play a Native American, uh, and not, you know, some people might argue, well, can only Native American, that's, that's really, you know, I've heard this argument before. If you make a movie about Italians, can only Italians play them, you know, so, so and so. But the thing is, you have to get someone who looks the part, who can pass for that, you know, it's like, for instance, it's that famous story that, they, they, you know, originally Paramount wanted Robert Redford to play Michael Corleone because they thought he was more bankable at the box office. Now, forget the fact that, you know, Al Pacino obviously gave an iconic career-defining performance in the role, but Robert Redford simply doesn't look like an Italian mobster. It's ridiculous. It's, a, you know, if you, maybe for the Robert Duvall role, but it's just, it's just, it's absurd. And I would actually say that Rooney Mara playing Tiger Lily is equally absurd, considering especially, like, look at the shortlist they had for the Warner, you know, for Warner Brothers had uh, for um, Wonder Woman. They had, uh, I, for, uh, I forget the name of the actresses off the top of my head, but they had the, the actress from G.I. Joe Retaliation who played, uh, you know, uh, Snake Eyes sidekick. You know, she, she was on the short list, and I think they had some other act actresses. So you could get one of those people. And that's even the same studio. I don't see why they just didn't pick that up and go, okay, well, who didn't we pick for Wonder Woman? Let's have her be Tiger Lily. And so to have, you know, and there are Native American actresses there, you know, there are lots of actresses who could pass for Native American. Rooney Mara isn't one of them. So I think it's just really unfortunate to, to see this kind of, you know, whitewashing of a role as we discuss the potential of a black lead in Star Wars. So the more things change, I guess the more they stay the same. You know, and Peter Pan, just in case you aren't familiar with the project, it's shaping up to have Hugh Jackman as the villain, a pirate called Blackbeard. I don't know how they're going to reconcile that with uh, the Blackbeard, I, th I think, over in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, but whatever. Then Garrett Hedlund will be Captain Hook, a newcomer, supposedly will be Peter Pan. We'll see if they actually go with a newcomer. They had open casting calls for that. And then you have Rooney Mara as Tiger Lily. But also, isn't Tiger Lily supposed to be a Peter Pan love interest? But you're really putting her in the age group of Garrett uh, Hudland as Captain Hook. So that's like a whole different dynamic as well. So I don't know. I'm all for reimagining these fairy tales in live action. But I think it's better... I think telling a prequel is tricky. I would rather they continue the story. Uh, a little bit like Hook, which, you know, has its... Uh, you know, the Robin Williams film. Not a huge success. Uh, not widely loved. But I think there was a lot good that was there. Uh, so anyway, I'm curious how you guys feel. Do you agree with me? Do you think that Rooney Mara is, you know, it's a shame to whitewash the role of Tiger Lily, one of the most famous Native Americans? It's like, it's just the same. A lot of people are angry about Johnny Depp as Tonto. Uh, I thought he actually pulled off the role, uh, but then, you know, at the same time, uh, I think he looks more Native American than uh, Rooney Mara. And also, he claimed he was partially, you know, Native, Native American. But I guess at the same time, I can't be angry about Rooney Mara and not be angry about Johnny Depp. But, you know, it's another role that could have gone to an actor of color going to a white actress. And I just think it's it's a shame. And Rooney Mara is not even a box office draw. I don't understand the, 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 the thinking process here. So that's the second story of the day. 
The third story is very uncontroversial, and it's that Jason Sudeikis looks like he's going to take over the Fletch franchise. And it's very fitting because, uh, obviously, Chevy Chase was the original Fletch. He was also from, also from Saturday Night Live. Uh, and I think when I first heard the news, I thought to myself, can Jason Sudeikis really pull this off? Because Fletch is supposed to be somewhat attractive. And Jason Sudeikis, I, I haven't really seen it. I haven't seen that kind of quality in him, you know, uh, any sex appeal, I guess you could say. Uh, but then, you know, I, I, I saw, recently saw We're the Millers, uh, actually just the other day, because uh, I was like, I, I'd seen all the other movies on demand, and so I was like one of the few I hadn't seen, and I hadn't gone because I was like, I don't want to watch Jennifer Aniston strip. That's not for me. And I have to say, well, the movie got a little bit too inappropriate for me at points, uh, just me personally. Uh, it did make me laugh. It had some good points. It was better than I thought it would be, and I can see why it was such a hit. But the reason I bring it up is that Jason Sudeikis was very good in the film. And I began to see, you know, shades of Fletch. You know, he's, he was a viable romantic interest, I thought, for Jennifer Aniston. I thought he had a good attitude. I liked a lot of the way he delivered his lines. Uh, he was very funny even in the beginning when he was interacting with um, that kid, you know, his Bane thing, his Bane impression. Very funny. He did a lot of good physical humor, that scene where he falls into the trash compactor. I don't want to ruin it. or the, that, was, that really made me laugh out loud. So I finally was like, okay. Jason Sudeikis, perhaps I've underestimated you. Maybe you can be Fletch. Now, the question is, Fletch, can a Fletch franchise be competitive at the box office? Uh, comedians, it's become a very competitive market. Will Ferrell is struggling even these days. Ben Stiller is struggling. Adam Sandler is struggling. Perhaps Jason Sudeikis is the new comedic talent. Horrible Bosses was a big hit, and so was We're the Millers. He's had some flops, though. Uh, so the question is, I, mean, I think Fletch will have to have really good uh, screenwriting and good supporting cast, and obviously a great trailer. But it's going to be an origin story. They're rebooting it. Of course, there were two Fletch movies. I think this will be Fletch 1, uh, but like spelled W-O-N, like he won something. And the first obviously was Fletch and Fletch Lives. But they're not going to just jump into the Fletch storyline. They're going to have an origin story, uh, which is as all the rage these days. I don't know if it's necessary, but then at the same time, I don't think Fletch is a really uh, pop culture friendly, you know, property. I don't think everyone, it's not like Spider-Man where everybody knows how he became Spider-Man or everyone knows how Batman became, you know, Bruce Wayne became Batman, etc., etc. With other with comic book properties. I think Fletch is something that maybe does need to be redefined. But this is a very big career move for Jason Sudeikis. He's making Horrible Bosses too, obviously. But you could have argued, even with We're the Millers and uh, both Horrible Bosses movie, the first one and the second one coming out, they're ensemble casts. I mean, you know, Jennifer Aniston, how much did she bring in? You know, this will be the first time that Jason Sudeikis will have to, you know, stand on his own and prove that he is a box office draw. So very interesting choice, but I'm beginning to see it. Curious to how you guys feel. Do you think there's an audience for Fletch? Do you see Jason Sudeikis as Fletch? Uh, write your thoughts down below. And also, did you enjoy Where the Millers? Uh, I'm curious to how, what your guys' uh, thoughts on it. Obviously, a lot of people saw it. All right, so today's viewer question is actually three viewer questions combined, because three people asked pretty much the same thing. So I'm going to read their questions and then kind of give the overall answer. Now, yesterday I did an all viewer question episode, and I talked about uh, different jobs behind the scenes. Uh, and a lot of people have said, well, I would like to know more about producing. So let me go through the questions. The first is from Lux Neji, who says, question, hi, Grace. Uh, first question, I've been watching the show since around summer 2009. That is awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, great show. Keep up the good work. But I was wondering, I'm studying finance. And I know I really liked my career, but I would like to link it with movies. I know that studios need that need that role. But what about a specific movie? Is it that the producer who uh, is it the producer who takes care of the financial aspect, or is it a special role, or uh, should I should I pursue what should I pursue to become a producer? Thanks in advance. So basically, Lux Neji uh, is studying finance, but is interested in perhaps moving into film producing, and is wondering if that's the background that he or she needs. All right. Then the other question, uh, another question comes from Michael Mata. Who says, hi Grace, really love your show. Thank you, Michael. Quick question, what does it take to be a movie producer? I plan uh, to study accounting in college and hopefully enter the movie industry through the business side of things. Do you need to have a lot of experience in the making of movies or just be good with managing numbers? Thanks in advance. Oh, I'm getting smiley faces from everybody. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Uh, so that's another question. Then also the final question is from Jorge Altam Altamariano. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name, uh, Jorge. And he says, hey Grace. This question is similar to the one on agents, managers, and publicists. That's what I answered yesterday. And he says, what are the differences between an executive producer, a producer, and a line producer? Excellent question, Jorge. And I think this all ties in with what everybody's asking here. And I think those roles are all very different. And I think it's important that you guys understand the differences because I see some mis 
um, misconceptions here because a producer has nothing to do with the finances of a film. I mean, they help raise the money. That's very crucial. Uh, getting together financing either for like a, a lump sum for their production company or, or just for a single film. But that is one job that a producer has. And I think clearly some of you have mistaken that for being in charge of the finances of the film in general, which is not the case. So before you go too far along that path, I just want you to know what you're getting into. Now, of course, if you're studying finance, every studio has accountants. So you could always go and work for a major studio as one of their accountants. I don't know if you're going to be part of the glamorousness of Hollywood that might be why you want to go into the film industry, but you will work for a major studio, be on the lot, and often get the perks that go with being a major in a major studio. For instance, if you work for the Disney company, you get to go to Disney World for free. Uh, and you get to stay, you get a discount at the hotels, they take, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice perk. Uh, so there, there's, you, get to be on the, you get to be on the lot. There's a lot of nice things about it. So that's definitely a very viable career, being an accountant for a major studio. And also, I'm sure everybody needs a numbers person, so you could probably find that role in production companies as well. But as for a specific movie, let's go down the line. All right, so let's start out with the producer. And I think it's great that so many of you are interested in that as a career. It's a very rewarded career. That's who gets the Oscar when someone wins Best Picture, the producers. It's a very powerful role and, you know, often doesn't get a lot as much attention as it should. I mean, there of course, there are super producers like Harvey Weinstein, Scott Rudin, uh, Joel Silver. Um, but, you know, a lot of times producers, don't, I don't think, get the attention they deserve. Kevin Feige, to some degree, is a producer. So what a producer does is a producer puts a film together. They are the one uh, you know, that's why often you'll see a director take on a producing credit uh, because they're helping to handle the film from that end. And a producer is very powerful on a movie, uh, especially if they're a power producer, like the names I just mentioned. If you are a producer who's starting out and you have talent that's bigger than you and like you're very lucky to get them, obviously you to some degree defer to that talent. I'm talking in terms of the actors or directors. And sometimes that director, actor or director will come on as a co-producer with you to, to, to warrant their power in the, over the film. But what a producer does is not only help raise the money, but they also secure uh, a, a distribution deal off, often. You know, for instance, when let's say uh, at, so, at a film festival, you hear all the time that a studio buys an independent film. They will be meeting with the producers. The director is not privy to that discussion. It's the producers that handle what the price for that film will be in the negotiations. Uh, they are the ones, the producer often, who will attach the actors before they even a director is attached. They put the movie together. They put all the pieces together. They hold it all together. Uh, and, and they're the ones, often the final say, you know, even with an Oscar campaign, they, uh, you know, they don't get to make creative decisions, like they aren't writing the script, they're not choosing the shots, they're not uh, deciding to tell an actor what to do, that's not a producer's place. But a producer helps put all those pieces together, sits back and watches the show, but also can come in there and go, I think this is actually going in the wrong direction, and that it would be, like for instance, it would be inappropriate for a producer really to talk to an actor, but you know, they work very closely with the director and say, you know, I think this actor could be doing a better job, I don't like the performance they're giving. And the producer also has to keep their eye on the, you know, the prospects of the film, be it at the box office or award season. Just as you see Harvey Weinstein arguing with Olivier de Haan over the cut of Grace of Monaco. He's not doing that just because Harvey Weinstein has some bold creative vision. It's because Harvey Weinstein feels that the film that Olivier de Haan is delivering isn't competitive in the ways that he needs it to be, which is why he's ordering a recut. So it's the producer's job to look out for that, to be that you know, to be the, the voice of reason in the face of all the creativity coming from this team he's put together. So that's what a producer does. They're a deal maker. If you want to be a producer, I highly recommend you study producing. There are courses in it at many film schools. Any film school will offer a course in producing. Uh, that's, I think, the best way to learn how to do it. And that's the way how to get into the, if you want to become a producer, what you can do is you can go work for another producer, for starting out as an assistant, work your way up within their organization at a production company. That's one way to do it. Also, you can just start producing your own films. By the way, Someone put some advice yesterday in the comments. Uh, I think it was Lou Archer, 1949. And he said that Robert Rodriguez's advice was, to, if you wanted to be in the film business, go make a movie, and anything else is just spinning your wheels. And I think, while that does work for some people, that's dangerous advice. A lot of films that are made never see the light of day. They don't even get into film festivals. Forget even being picked up when they get into the film festival. And even getting into a film festival has become quite political. So if you have no industry connections, uh, and I'm glad Robert Rodriguez's career worked out, and for some people this does work, but it is a huge risk. So I think it's irresponsible to tell somebody that if they don't do 
uh, if they and, and this isn't directed at Lou Archer 1949 by the way this is directed at Robert Rodriguez I think it's very irresponsible to tell people they don't truly want it if they're not willing to go and make their own movie and, and experiment on their own because it's a lot of money to make a movie it takes a long time that's time you could be developing to getting into the industry other ways so unless you unless you're like direct or die um, there are other ways you can get to the industry that are a little bit safer a little bit you know have a little more job security and just don't think because you make a movie that anyone's going to see it. You can't submit it often. They, so many movies are being made, they won't even look at it when you send it in. There are submission agreements. You, an agent, you can, you, if you think you can send your movie to uh, an agency or a studio, you can't without an agent having sent it for you. And then the agent often won't look at it. There are a lot of walls to get into Hollywood. It is extremely difficult. So don't think just because you made a movie, it's going to be the beginning of your career. Uh, it's, it's a sad truth that there are a lot of films that never see the light of day. So I just wanted to add that in there. So, but if you want to be, so if you want to be producer though, that's another way you can go and produce an independent film yourself, and that's how you can get your start. But again, you know, make sure. Remember, as the producer, you're the voice of reason. Does your film actually have a shot of getting into a festival? Do you actually have a shot at getting anywhere? That's you really have to be honest with yourself. Um, because that's the hard reality of the movie making business. All right, so that's what a producer does. Now, an executive producer is somebody who's really just helped the movie somehow. It's a credit that you give to someone who gives you a ton of the money, or uh, often this, the executives at the studio will take that credit. Harvey Weinstein is the executive producer on a ton of movies that he only bought at the, at the film festival. He goes and per picks it up and says, I love your movie, I want to I distribute it, I'm now an executive producer. An executive producer is someone who enabled the movie to get made, but usually just through a single action. It's usually a very powerful person. So that's an executive producer. Uh, you don't aspire to become an executive producer. It's uh, something that goes out to people who are already producers or working in the industry or suits. Uh, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's like a really nice thank, thank you, thanks to. Uh, now, a line producer, and I want to bring up a line producer in uh, addition with a, a unit production manager. These are two kind of similar jobs, but they're very different. Now, the line producer, that's the job that you, need, you, require, you have to know finances. That's the person who puts the budget together. And you know, just because you know finances doesn't mean you know movie finances. Movie finances are extremely difficult, extremely intricate. And if you want to work in the movie industry, you really need to get a course on uh, industry, you know, movie making, the budgets. Um, and also, uh, I would suggest you go and find some budgets online. Uh, there are a lot of very good books about this uh, to really see all the different levels. I mean, you have to know unions. Uh, there are a lot of rules uh, you know, for how you put a budget together. And it's, oftentimes several budgets. So that's what a line producer does. Now the unit production manager is almost like um, the uh, secretary, for lack, of, for lack of a better word, of a film. The UPM in, you know, puts together the plan of the line producer, you know, implements it and make sure it also handles, make sure everybody's showing up. You know, it kind of like um, checking everybody's time cards, making everything sure everything runs smoothly. You're like the train conductor to some degree. So those are the different levels of producer. Just because uh, something has producer in the title doesn't mean they're all kind of similar jobs. As you can see, they're very different. Uh, so executive producer, that's kind of like this extreme thank you. Uh, the producer is the person, the deal maker, the, you know, the fast talker, the person who gets everything together and makes sure and it looks at a film from a business perspective. And I guess if a number, if you're watching this channel, you appreciate the business side of film, so I can see actually why a number of you would be interested in producing. So great, great job. These are all great jobs, but a producer, as I said, doesn't get the credit it deserves. Uh, also, and then a line producer, that's more, that's the, that's the finances. If you're studying, fi studying finances, that's where you're going to want to look if you don't want to be a, an accountant at a studio. And then also there's the unit production manager who, uh, you know, is, makes, keeps a movie running. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, if you're interested in this more, there are a lot of great books out there that you can look up that will give you some insight into this. Uh, and also, you know, you can take a course somewhere uh, at a film school. I'm sure there's even like probably like a, you know, a limited course. You don't have to, I'm sure, enroll in a full film school to kind of get this hands-on experience. But um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is these are all very, very unique professions and they have their own set of rules. So just because you've studied things in general, like if you studied business in general or finances in general, don't think that means you know how a movie is put together. It's its own little world. Just like I guess any industry to some degree. But I think it's unique in that it's one of the few industries where as little as the real world applies as possible. All right, so I hope that's helpful. I thank you for your questions, uh, and I hope you'll let me know what you would like uh, to see covered on Monday and any questions you might have that you'd like to see answered then. Thank you for watching. Bye.